Bless God Almighty. Good morning, Times Square Church. I trust that you're doing well this week. If you would turn to the book of 1 Corinthians, please, with me. Chapter 1. I hope to answer the question this morning, why is God's strength made perfect in our weakness? Why is God's strength made perfect in our weakness? Now, Lord, I just thank you for the anointing of your Holy Spirit. I thank you, God, for the incredible truth of your word. Thank you, Lord, for the depth of your mercy. Thank you, Lord, that you're willing to take any of us to use for your glory. Jesus, Son of God, come upon me today, Lord, in the power of the Holy Spirit, and give me the power to speak this word. My mind is not sufficient, Lord, to comprehend it. You have to expand the borders of my understanding. You have to give me the intonations of voice. You have to put the passion in my heart. I pray for this congregation that you give us the ears to hear this today. To be able to understand it and to embrace it. This is an incredible truth. And Lord, we thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. First Corinthians chapter 1, verse 26 to 31. How many have the King James Bible here? Can I see your hands? Okay, with the King James, I'm going to ask you to read along with me, please, this morning, if you will, and share it with the persons beside you, if you can. Beginning at verse 26. For you see your calling, brethren, how that not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. But God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. And God has chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty, and base things of the world, and things which are despised, hath God chosen, yea, and things that are not, to bring to naught things that are, that no flesh should glory in his presence. But of him are ye in Christ Jesus, who of God is made unto us wisdom, and righteousness, and sanctification, and redemption, that according as it is written, he that glories, let him glory in the Lord. Hallelujah. Turn to the person beside you and say, according to the word of God, you are foolish, weak, and base. Hallelujah. Now the weak are happy and the proud are upset right at this very moment. <laughs> but why is God's strength made perfect in our weakness? Now Paul, the apostle, didn't write this just because he was looking for things to write in the word of God. He had a personal revelation of this. He was brought, according to the words of his own mouth, into the place that he referred to as the third heaven. He was brought into the place, in a sense, where God dwells. And in that place, he saw things that he said are not allowed to be spoken. I can't, Paul was basically saying, I can't repeat it. And the Lord had shown him that it wasn't even lawful to write it down, what he had seen. He had seen something so divine, so incredible, so holy, that it could not be put down in writing on, on paper. And having come back from that kind of a revelation... Paul dealing with the same condition that you and I deal with, because the, remember the inherent sin of man in the Garden of Eden is this desire to be as God, and knowledge will puff up. Knowledge can bring us to a place where we actually become the teachers who are in ourselves unteachable. We can actually come to the place through study where we no longer even represent God. Unless that should happen to Paul because of the abundance of the revelation, he tells us there was given to him a thorn in the flesh, a messenger of Satan that was sent to buffet him. And it, it, so, it so troubled him in his, in his body and in his mind that he, he went to the Lord three times and said, God, would you please take this away from me? 
I, I, perhaps Paul argued with the Lord and said, I don't see the reason for this. Uh, you know I'm going to serve you. You know I'm going to walk with you. But the Lord made a profound statement to Paul and he said, my grace is sufficient for you. My ability to carry you and to sustain you is all that you need for my strength is made perfect in weakness. My strength is made perfect in weakness. That really is in measure the reason why those who are wise in the flesh and those who are mighty in themselves, those who feel more noble than other people in humanity, those who believe that they are superior or stronger to other people, most often, even with study, live outside of the power of God. They increase in knowledge, but it never brings them to an understanding of what, who God is and what God really is desiring and able to do through all of fallen humanity around them. Now, to understand why God had to make Paul weak, let's go to Isaiah chapter 6 for a moment, please, if you will. Go in the back to Psalms, Proverbs, and then very shortly after that is you'll find the book of Isaiah. Chapter 6. Now, this is another story of a young man who's about to be brought into ministry in the year it says that King Uzziah died. Now, remember, Uzziah is a king who died in, in pride, in, in the disease of his mind. He, he thought he could be as God. He thought he could do anything he wanted to. He, he walked into the temple and began to offer incense on the altar of incense when it was strictly forbidden him. And in a sense, his, his base nature had taken over him. And he had become what Satan sowed into Adam in the Garden of Eden and Eve. That he, he himself could be as God, chart his own course, do what he wanted to do, even in the name of God, and suffer no consequence for it. You see, in the year that King Uzziah dies, that's when we're brought into the... In the year that pride dies. In the year that we begin to realize that... And you and I realize that we are base. We are small. We, we don't have any strength in ourselves. We, we would never get through this life and certainly never get into heaven without the mercy of God. In the year that Uzziah dies, in the year that, that our natural tendency to, to do our own thing, even in the name of God, dies. In the year that we finally come to an understanding that we don't make the rules, God does. That we don't have the right to chart the own, our own course in life, God has the right. In the year that Uzziah dies... I, he said, Isaiah said, I saw the Lord. I saw him in the year that pride died. And Uzziah does represent pride. Remember, and very often many young people, especially, or any of us who are going to be called into the ministry, are going to have to have this vision of God. Ezekiel had a similar vision. Daniel had a, a somewhat similar experience in the presence of God. To, to be called into the work of God, there's a requirement. We have to come to the understanding that his strength is not made perfect through our strength. His strength is perfected in our weakness. Uzziah, Isaiah rather, is about to be brought into ministry. Now, it seems that Isaiah was already at least a marginally a prophet at this point. He was already probably from a priestly family, familiar with the temple, familiar with the religion of his day. Uh, might have been a gifted young man, maybe... Some of the elders in the temple saw him, picked him out, saw something of nobility or strength in him. And perhaps he was already being more or less promoted, as, uh, as people would see it in the religious side of things on the earth, in the kingdom of God. But God was about to commission him. And I have a feeling in my heart that the Lord is about to commission us. Now, I'm, I'm not just saying this because of this message. It's something that's so very deep. We're going into revival, folks, in New York City. And God is about to commission us to represent him in the city. And, and yet we sit here this morning, many, and say, Oh, God, I've, I've, I've walked so long with you, but I, I've, I'm so weak. And I, I, I learned so much, but so little of it seems to be applied to my life. And I don't have any degrees. And I'm not as smart as other people. And I, I don't have nobility in the background. I don't have an army behind me. I don't have a budget. I don't have anything. But Lord, I somehow strangely feel that you want to use me for your glory in the days ahead. But how are you going to use me? And why? And how does this whole relationship 
between you and I work. I thought I had to be strong for you. Don't I have to have it all together? Don't I have to understand the scripture? Don't I have to be able to quote at least 300 verses of scripture to be effective? God, my prayer life hardly has life. It's on resuscitation. I'm just being honest. I'm not talking about myself right now, but that's the, <laughs> that's the cry of many hearts. I've been there. I know what that's all about. Well, you almost need two paddles to, to, on your chest to pray in the morning. And in our, in our weakness, there, there have been times through my life, as even in ministry, that I, I wondered, how could God use me? I, I, don't, I don't have the pedigree of others, and I don't, I don't have a Christian background. And when I got into ministry, I didn't even know how the thing worked. I just know that I, I, I used to get things from God, and I'd speak them, and people would get saved. And in the year that King Uzziah died, he said, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne high and lifted up. Now, Paul says in Colossians 1.16, By him were all things created in heaven and in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him. And he is before all things and by him all things consist. Number one, he is above everything. Every name that is named, every kingdom that ever will be, every power, every principality, every circumstance, every situation, every trouble, every trial, every mountain, every valley. He's above it all. And everything was created for him and by him for a divine purpose. Everything that we see, everything that we know, everything that we experience, everything that we have to go through, he stands above all of it. Nothing will ever take the Son of God by surprise. Nothing escapes his attention. Nothing is allowed to happen without his permission. Why do the heathen rage, David said, and imagine a vain thing? He who sits that they can cast off the Lord and cast off his anointed. He said, he who sits in heaven shall laugh and have them in derision. He stands above it all. And how foolish for any of humankind to think they can cast off the presence or government of God. How utterly foolish. He's high and lifted up. So no matter where you are today, he is above your situation. And if you are in him, that means that he is able to take you out. He's able to make you and I into everything that he's ever promised us he would. And his train, that means the, the border of his garment filled the temple. Now think about this for a moment. In Matthew chapter 9, verses 20 and 21, there was a, a lady who had a sickness in her body. And she said to herself, if I can just touch the hem of his garment, I will be whole. And so she had to more or less perhaps climb a bit of a hill. She had to press through a crowd that, that everybody wanted to get close to him. And it, it must have been difficult. She had, to, she had to press through and then finally made her way through the crowd with a lot of effort and touched the hem of his garment. And immediately the problem she had in her body was healed. His garment was only on one physical body. The man Jesus Christ, it was confined to probably a three-foot radius at that point. Wherever he was, where he walked, to touch the hem of his garment, you had to travel miles. You had to go through crowds to get there. But Isaiah said, I saw him. I was lifted up. And his, his garment, the, the hem of his garment, filled the temple. There was nowhere in the temple where you couldn't touch him and be healed. Now listen to me. We are the temple of the Holy Spirit. In the New Testament church, do you understand? The presence of Christ is within us. And what Isaiah saw is a reality in the actual body of a New Testament believer. That the hem of his garment fills the temple. There's no area of your mind, no area of your past, no area of your present or future or body that he can't touch. Or that you can't touch. That you can't reach out and literally touch. In other words, the healing of Jesus is in every part of you. There's nowhere where you can't be healed. There's nothing he can't touch. Actually, there's nowhere where you can't touch him and be healed. And above all of this, verse 2, stood the seraphims. Each one had six wings, and with two he covered his face. With two his feet, and with two he did fly. Now that's incredible when you think of it. 
Now, these are created beings at the throne of God. Now, Isaiah is standing there looking at this. They have six wings. And I'm assuming that the top two, it says they cover their face. And with the bottom two, they cover their feet. And with the middle two, they're flying. And so, looking at this, Isaiah would have to draw a conclusion, as I would if I was there, that they're not looking where they're going. They're covering their face with the top two wings. And they're... And the secondly, they're not traveling where they're going in any amount of natural strength. They're covering their feet. They're flying by divine power. They're moving by divine power. I wonder how many of them there were. When, when you and I get to heaven, this is going to... Paul, I believe Paul saw this. It's incredible. And there's perhaps hundreds, maybe thousands of these created beings around about the throne. <clears throat> when you read Ezekiel, you seem to get the impression that they can move literally at the speed of light. And yet they never crash into one another. In other words, everything is in divine order. Where God is, there's order. Where everything that is created and in subjection to him knows its course in life, knows where it's to go, knows what it's to be doing, and flies or moves together. Paul said in the book of Acts, in him we live and we move and we have our being. We're not crashing into things. We know where we're going because he's the one who's leading us. We're not walking by sight nor by power, but by the spirit of almighty God. We don't have to figure it out with our eyes. We don't have to see it with our eyes. We don't have to achieve it with the strength of our, of our own feet and our own labors. But God, by the Holy Spirit, has promised to carry us and to make us into everything that he's ever promised us to be. Praise be to God. And they cried one to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. Holy. It's the only word they, they knew. And what it really means in the Hebrew is separate from all sin, separate from death, separate from idolatry, without any equal anywhere and completely perfect. Free from moral imperfections and all the failures of humanity. And it also means he's absolutely faithful to every one of his promises. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. Now, how could the earth be full of his glory? You walk out of this church today into the streets of Manhattan... You travel through the boroughs of New York City. You read the newspaper. You say, Lord, is, am I missing something here? Now, how, now, I know the heavens declare the glory of God. The, the order that's in nature declares the glory of God. So there's, there's a partial fulfillment in that. But how is the earth filled with your glory? Well, you see, it's simply this, that the church of Jesus Christ, you and I are still here. The glory of God abides in this temple and all of, there's a church of Jesus all over the earth. That's why the earth is filled with his glory. I think the problem that we face as people is we don't know who we are in Christ. We don't understand who's inside of us. We, we live so much of our time trying to be, trying to be what only God can make us. Trying to do or go where only he can lead us. Holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. It's so important that we know this when we pray. That we're coming to a throne above every other throne. We're coming to a place of absolute and complete divine order. We're coming to a place where healing flows everywhere where he is. We're coming to a place where he is absolutely above anything we could ever hope to be and completely faithful to all of his promises. When we come to him in prayer, we have to realize that he has commissioned us to be his representatives on the earth until the day he takes his church home to be with him forever. And when we pray, it says, the posts of the door moved at the voice of him that cried and the house was filled with smoke. The posts of the door moved. Now, I've, I've searched that out in so many different places and the best as I, I can understand it is that from the threshold of the door to the sides of every opening in the temple from simply just waving from side to side or heaving from top to bottom to moving to a, a completely different place. The door, the doors moved. You, in other words, 
to the church of Philadelphia. He said, you have a little strength and you've not denied my name. He said, behold, I set before you an open door and no man can shut it. When you and I know who God is, when we come into the prayer closet realizing who it is that we're serving, when we finally understand that nothing is impossible to him, and we begin to cry out, holy, 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 oh God almighty. And we begin to say, Lord, you are faithful to your promises and anything you want to do with my life, you're well able to do it. Then suddenly a door can appear before you. What was impossible becomes possible. Where the enemy planted a wall and said this far and no farther. God says, no, I set before you an open door and no man can close it. I didn't call you because you're strong. I called you because you're weak. I didn't call you because you're smart. I called you because you're foolish. I didn't call you because you're noble. I called you because you're nothing. I called you to represent my kingdom. And here's where it gets to be interesting. When Isaiah saw this in verse 5, he says, Woe is me, I am undone. I'm a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. I am undone. Everything I thought I was, everywhere I thought I was going, how I thought I was so wonderfully representing the kingdom of God or not representing the kingdom of God. All of our boast, you have to understand, he comes from perhaps the most religious people on the face of the earth and they legitimately laid claim at that time to being exclusively the people of God on the earth. And there was just a myriad of religious exercise going on and and potential study of the word of God and practical exercises in the temple. And Isaiah said, it's unclean. It's all unclean. It's, we, we claim to know God, but we don't know anything about God. We claim to be smart, but we're ignorant. We claim to be strong, but we're weak. We claim to have it all. And we, we claim to be holier than thou, but mine eyes have seen the king. Mine eyes have seen the Lord of hosts. And I know that all of my boasting and all of my promises to God are worthless. The things I've stood and said, the times that I've said, this is what God looks like. This is how God feels. This is what God thinks. He said, it's all short because mine eyes have finally seen his glory. And the whole of the nation, he said, is unclean. And our speech is unclean. My eyes have seen the king, the Lord of hosts. We fall so short of this divine order. Isaiah could rightly say, everything I am, everything I thought I could add in my own strength to God's kingdom has suddenly fallen into ruin. What have I got to give to this kingdom? What can I do to help this? He's the worst off in the whole place. His life is a mess and he knows it. He's weak and he's aware of it. He has no strength and he's become completely filled with the understanding that there's nothing I can do here to add to this. This is so far beyond me. This place is holy. This place operates in divine order. There's absolute truth and perfection here. How in the world can I ever be part of this in my condition? Now he's about to be given the greatest revelation of all. It says, then flew, verse 6, one of the seraphims unto me, having a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with the tongs from off the altar. And he laid it upon my mouth and said, lo, this has touched thy lips, and thine iniquity is taken away, and thy sin is purged. And that coal speaks to me of the cross of Jesus Christ. I've come and I've touched you. And you don't have to make any promises to me anymore. You can't fulfill your promises to me. The kingdom of God will not advance in you and through you because of anything you promise to be or to do for me. It's not about your promises to me. It's about my promises to you. All you have to do, if you want clean lips, you just speak back to me the things that I've promised. When you go in the prayer closet and you say, Lord, I'm an angry person, but you have promised to make me gentle. You have promised to give me a loving heart. I read it in the book. It says, you don't have to come to me with unclean lips anymore. You come and bring back. Just like Hannah, when Samuel was born to her, she brought back that which was given her of God and brought it back into the temple. He says, I've given you my 
my redemption. I've given you my promises. Now you come into the prayer closet knowing who I am. I'm above your weakness. I'm above your frailty. I'm above your circumstance. You don't bring me any promises. Don't tell me you're going to do better because you're not going to do better in your own strength. Don't tell me these things. Don't, I don't want to hear that you're going to pray more. You're going to read more. You're going to study more. You're going to do more. You bring my promises back to my throne. Hallelujah. I've touched your lips. Praise God. And he says, and your iniquity is taken away. Now the iniquity is, from my understanding, is, is human effort. It's, it's everything that we thought we could be to be as God. It's, it's that essential sin that's been sown into the human race. That, that thought that we, would, we can add to the kingdom of God. Somehow we can figure it out. We can do this. We can make God's kingdom grow in our own reasoning and strength. Remember Zechariah 4, 6. He said, not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. Your, not, my, not your promises to me, but my promises to you. Not human effort. But Isaiah, you've now seen that this kingdom moves by the power of the Holy Spirit. No, not by human effort but by the leading and empowerment of the Holy Spirit of Almighty God, bringing every one of these promises to life inside of you. And when you fall short, remember that the the border of his garment fills the temple. And you can come and say, Lord, you've got to touch me. You've got to touch me in this area, Jesus. You've got to heal me. And the Lord says, just reach out. It's all yours. It's all yours. It's all in this book. It's all here, folks. It's all here. And my iniquities is taken away and thy sin is purged. In other words, the the damning power of sin is gone. The light controlling power of sin is broken. Jesus said it is finished and it is finished. It's all broken. I don't live under the dominion of sin anymore. And neither do you. You are absolutely free from its power. You're free from its life controlling force. By the shed blood of Jesus Christ. Now Isaiah, with this revelation, just like Paul, begins to hear the voice of the Lord. And God is speaking to himself and saying, who shall I send and who will go for us? Now, what would you do in that situation? You're standing there and you see this and you feel completely undone. What would you do this morning if I gave an altar call and say the Lord is looking for evangelists starting today? Who will go? Who will God send? Our natural tendency is to look around us, say, well, send Pastor William or Pastor Patrick. I mean, these guys are good. I mean, you, you obviously got everything you need right here. And Isaiah is the worst off in the whole, if this was a a play that you could see, he's the worst off in the whole place. He's the only guy that doesn't have it together. He's the only one that's not, not really at that point operating in divine power. He's the only one that's completely undone. Everyone else seems to have it all together. Who will go? Who will we send? And it's like this little hand in the back row comes up and says, I'll go. It's, you'd expect all of heaven to, to gasp and say, it, it's like if we ask for a new elder for, or something in Times Square Church and the, you know, somebody that really is unqualified raises their hand and says, boy, I'd like to do that. And that's what heaven would feel like when, when Isaiah raised his hand. You see, <clears throat> Isaiah had come to the revelation that the kingdom of God is about mercy. He's the only one there that needed mercy. Nobody else needed mercy. He needed mercy. He said, I'm undone. I'm finished. We're all finished. And if God is not merciful to us, we're doomed. We'll never be able to occupy this place. If he doesn't do something, God's got to do something for us. He had realized he'd been taken from a place where people thought they were strong. They thought they were mighty. They thought they were influential. They thought they had spiritual knowledge. Only to stand in the presence of God and say, we're all doomed. 
We're finished, God. If you deal with us in the manner that we deserve, who among us is going to be able to stand? And suddenly he's touched with the power of God. He's touched with the mercy of God. He's touched with the cleansing of God. He's touched with everything that Jesus did on the cross of Calvary. And he has this revelation. God wants to show us mercy. That's why he raised his hand. That's why he said, I'll go. I'll go. They need to know that all of our righteousnesses are as filthy rags. They need to understand that God, the only way we're ever going to get through this is you're going to have to come even if it's as a root out of dry ground. You're going to have to come. You're going to have to open the book. You're going to have to say the spirit of the Lord is upon me. You're going to have to touch us with that live call. You're going to have to touch our lips and our lives. Yes, judgment is coming and Isaiah knew it. But he had a clear vision that the ministry of the church on the earth is mercy. Mercy. That's my message. That's your message when you leave this place today. And somebody asks you for a reason for the hope. Mercy, mercy. It's not because I've memorized things. It's not just because I go to church. It's not because I read my Bible X number of minutes or hours a day. I stand by mercy. The mercy of God. And suddenly you will be an evangelist. Suddenly you can open your mouth. Because he has not chosen the strong. Not chosen those who are noble in themselves. Not chosen those who have it all together. But those who know that I stand by mercy. The mercy of God has given me hope. The mercy of God has broken my sin. The mercy of God has made me and can make any person in this city a brand new creation in Christ Jesus. We're all on level ground, folks. The pride, the proud will form their own religion and unfortunately will take them nowhere. But those who know, those of us who know that we need a Savior, hallelujah to the Lamb of God. We don't need any more than just to say, Jesus, it's mercy. Mercy, my God, you've been merciful to me. You've touched me, Lord. You set before me an open door. Here am I. Send me. Hallelujah to the Lamb of God. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Mercy. Mercy. It's all about mercy. The lame take the prey. Isaiah was right. Isaiah wrote these words. Talking about the coming messianic kingdom, he said, and the lame take the prey. Jesus himself said, harlots and prostitutes and publicans will go into the kingdom of heaven before the religious will. Because they know they need mercy. They know they can't get in by their own strength. But the religious, unfortunately, oftentimes are not aware of that. Mercy. Mercy. And the moment you, what did Isaiah have to do? No more than the prodigal son did. God does the work. In our hearts, it's just to not resist it. To let God do his work. And to realize that it's not up to me to more or less embrace God's kingdom. It's up to God in his strength to embrace me and my weakness. And my part is simply just not, yes, I do, re, I do embrace his kingdom, but the, the reality is I don't have to bring any strength there. I come as I am, and he embraces me in his strength. When the, when the seraphim came with the call, he could have moved his head. and said, oh, no, even in pretended humility, oh, no, not me. Remember when Jesus came to Peter and said, I want to wash, oh, no, not me. Oh, no. And it can, have a, it can have an appearance of humility. And it can actually be resistance against that which truly allows the power of God to begin to flow in a person's life. Letting the power of the cross touch us. Letting the sacrifice of Calvary become sufficient for our sin. Letting God break the bondage of hell and evil. Realizing that the Christian life is a life that is lived in mercy. And the gospel that we preach is about the mercy of God. We've all sinned and come short of the glory of God. There's not one righteous. Isaiah could say it clearly, not even one, because he'd been there, he'd seen it. And Paul said, because 
I had this revelation. God, to protect me from pride, allowed a weakness to coexist with me in my body. And he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is perfected in weakness. So if you feel weak today, you can give God praise and glory for it. You can give him thanks and say, Lord, thank you, God. You have protected me from spiritual pride. And you've kept me in a place where I can speak for you. And I can go to anybody in the city. And I can say to them, the Lord has been merciful to me. I am not the strongest of people in his kingdom. But yet he has touched me. And his healing is beginning to flow in my life. And he's changing me. And it's a change that's happening sovereignly by his power. On my part, I simply yield to what he wants to do and let him begin to lead my life. And anybody can preach that gospel. The proud can't because it doesn't fit their theology. But you can. (laughs) Hallelujah. You can. And so the Lord says today for New York City and for wherever you happen to be from today, who will I send? What has held you back from opening your mouth and telling others about Jesus Christ? If not, that you have been very aware of your weakness. And the devil is there saying, well, no, you can't open your mouth because of this and this and this and this. When that weakness is the very thing that God will use to bring glory to his own name. Now, I'm not, I'm not suggesting that we, our whole testimony is that we fall and fail and fall and fail. No, I'm, I'm talking about that our strength and the source of our strength, because we are aware of our frailty, comes from God. The change that comes into our lives is given to us freely by Jesus Christ. And it's a gospel that everybody can preach. Isaiah knew it. Everybody can preach it. Everybody here can be an evangelist today. Everybody. All you have to know is that you're weak, foolish, base, and you're not the strongest in God's kingdom. But you cannot be stopped from speaking the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Who will go? It's not the Lord's will that this city should perish in its sin. Now, Isaiah was only given one in every ten souls, roughly, that he spoke to. But is it not worth it, even for the one in ten? Society in his time had become very hard to truth. We may be living in a similar time. But the Lord simply says, who will go? Who will start speaking? Who will not be ashamed, triumphed over? Who will understand that your strength is in God, not in yourself? Who will start to speak about the one who came and died on the cross and not have to be perfect to do it? Just aware that your strength is in God. Who will go? Who will go? Now, you may need healing today. You may need strength. You may need freedom in an area of your life. But if you'll get up and go, I believe that God will give you that. You'll become aware. You, it's, it's in this commission that you become aware of these things. If, if you'll make the choice to get up and go, folks, it isn't right that New York City end up in hell when so many of us know the Savior. It simply is just not right. It's time for us to speak. It is time. Not tomorrow, today. It's time to start speaking about Jesus Christ and the cross. It's time to, as he did, despise the shame that the world will try to put on you, put that away from you and say, no, this is true, this is right, this is eternal. And I'm only doing it because I'm not willing that you should die without Christ. It's time to speak, folks. The time of being quiet is over. Who will go? And if you can say today, I will, and trust God for the power, I'm going to give you an opportunity to come to the front of this sanctuary and we're going to pray together today and truly believe God This is a commissioning service for many here today. Truly, truly believe God that when you leave this sanctuary today, 
that the Holy Spirit will guide you into those places, into those people that the Lord wants you to speak to. Now let's stand together in the annex. You could stand between the screens. And if the Holy Spirit is drawing you to this, the front of this, just slip out wherever you are now. Who will go? Those people will say, I will. I will. I will. I'll speak. Young, old, rich, poor, it makes no difference. The Lord is no respecter of persons whatsoever. He'll put his spirit on the hungry heart. Let's worship for a little while, and as we do, just come. for us, Lord, and help us to walk through it, God. Help us to walk through it, God, because we can't stay quiet anymore, because there's a lot of people that need mercy. I know so many, Lord, and I'm afraid to speak. Please, Lord, we know what you did at the cross, Lord. There are no enemies left at the cross, Lord. You open the door, help us to walk through, God. God, and we bring you all our weaknesses, Lord, our cowardice, Lord God. We bring us our fears, Lord, we bring them to you, God. Lord, because you said you would open our mouths and fill it, God. Because somebody needs to hear that you've given them mercy, Lord. Because there's nothing left, God. There's nothing left to do, Jesus. Help us, Lord. Father, we love you. We love you, Lord. We give our lives, Lord God. We give you our hearts, Lord God. God, help us, Father. God, to come, Lord. We surrender, God. God, our weaknesses, our fears, Lord. Everything, Lord. God, mercy, God, mercy, it is 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 mercy, it's so mercy, your great mercy, God, mercy, give us mercy for the city, we ask for mercy to break out, Lord. Oh, God, mercy. Give us mercy, Father. Thank you for mercy on the city, Lord. 
Oh God, such great mercy and outpouring, Lord of mercy, God. God, that this city would know, God, that you truly are merciful, God. Lord, to the sinner, God, to anyone, to anyone, Lord, whosoever they might be, God, you will grant mercy. There's great mercy with you, Lord. Awesome mercy, God. There's great mercy, mercy, mercy today, Lord, mercy. Mercy, God, in this place, an outpouring of mercy, Lord. We worship you because we've known your mercy. We thank you, Lord, for mercy, God. We give you our sins. We give you, Lord, our iniquities. We give it all to you, God, our baggages, our troubles, our fears. Lord God, we bring it to the throne, Lord, and leave it there. We leave it there, God. We give it to you, Jesus, and we trust you and believe you, God, and leave it with you, Lord, because it's done, Lord. It's done, oh God, it's done. It's finished. It's finished, Lord. There's mercy, there's mercy, there's mercy. There's mercy, there's mercy. Hallelujah, Lord. Hallelujah, hallelujah. ask you for a mighty baptism of the Holy Spirit to come upon this church. God Almighty, not by might, not by power, but by your Spirit, O oh God. Thank you for the empowerment. Thank you for the boldness. Thank you for the strength, Lord. Paul said, in Jesus Christ is our wisdom, our righteousness, our sanctification, our redemption. He is everything that no flesh can glory. But he that glories, let him glory in the Lord. God Almighty, God Almighty, put a song of praise in our mouths. Put gladness in our hearts. Jesus, send us, Lord. Send us, God. Send us, mighty, mighty Christ. Send us, Lord, into the city. Father, we thank you, God, with all our heart. We thank you, Lord. Just say these words with me today. Here am I. Send me. Here am I. Can wash away my sin. The 